Well, I hope you brought a Bible. I would like for you to turn with me to the passage of Scripture that, that um, I'm going to call it the other Lord's Prayer. That's in John chapter 17. The other Lord's Prayer. Because you know, normally when you think of the Lord's Prayer, you automatically go to the uh, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, actually, that passage is the Lord's teaching on prayer, where he's teaching us to pray. Where he says, well, okay, you pray like this. It's not a method as much as it is a model. When he t- gives them a model for prayer, pray like this, our Father. You can call upon God the Father. What a revelation that is, that uh, you can cut out all the middlemen. That's what Jesus provided, you know, direct access. You don't have to pray to a saint. You don't have to pray through Mary. You don't have to pray through your dead Uncle George. You know, every now and then I'll hear people say, I, I pray to my dead uncle, you know, because I know he's, he was a good person. He's in heaven or my dead aunt or my grandmother because she was so godly. They're not mediators. Here's what the Lord said. Here's the model. The model is you have access, direct access through the blood of Christ to Almighty God. Do you know that you can come before the very presence of God? You can as a Christian by the blood of Christ. And that there's no human being on earth who has superior access to God than you do. You have the same access, the same access. You can come. And not only can you come, but you can call Almighty God Father. And what a revelation that is, that you don't have to come in some high, pious, practiced voice, O thou that residest in the heavens. You've heard those kind of prayers, very pious. The voice is very dramatic. But, But you can pray, Father, Father, Father. That's the prayer of relationship because the Almighty is your Father. You are His child. We sing a song sometimes that never fails to touch my heart. He knows my name. He knows my name. We've we've been studying in Galatians the last few weeks and months, whatever it's been, but the... Galatians chapter 4 talks about and says, Now that after you have known God, or rather, are known of God. Ha! How about that? God knows you. Not you it's one thing to say, I, I, I know God. It's another thing when the Bible declares, God knows you. That's you personally. You know, you think about it, sometimes people will... You ever heard of name droppers? They like to drop a name. Yeah, I, I, you know, I know who the governor... I know the governor. Drop a name. You're important, you know the governor. question is, does the governor know you? See, that's altogether different. You say you know him, why? Because you stood in line one time, shook his hand at some reception or whatever. But when the Bible says God knows you... Oh, yes, he knows you. He knows where you live. He knows your address. He knows what's in your checkbook and what's not. He knows everything you're going through, every feeling, every emotion, every trial, every trauma. Every time you feel lonely, and God knows that too. We can pray. Father, you know, that is, that Lord, that, what we call the Lord's Prayer is so profound. But, but I'm actually not teaching on that today. (laughs) 
Actually, I'm teaching on the other Lord's Prayer. See, the Lord's Prayer, He taught us to pray. But this Lord's Prayer, the other Lord's Prayer, sometimes referred to as the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ, the high priestly prayer of Christ. Let me tell you what this passage is. This passage gives us a profound look, a glimpse. It's like we are eavesdropping as we silently watch and listen to the Lord praying. That's what this is. This whole chapter is the Lord praying. So when you talk about the Lord's prayer, this is the Lord's prayer. The other one, that's the Lord teaching us to pray. But here, we get to eavesdrop on Jesus and listen to what he prayed. It's a profound passage of Scripture. It's the longest place, uh, the longest recorded prayer that we get to see uh, of the Lord in the Bible. It's a rather profound glimpse uh, as the Son prays to the Father. We see the Godhead working here. It's a... So let's, let's take a look at this passage. In chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. You know, beginning here, this is, you know, this is the culmination. This is the wind-up of the Lord's ministry on earth. This would be the last recorded prayer uh, for his disciples as he would pray for them. The first few verses here is basically he, he prays for himself, for, for, the, for, the, for the glory of the Father. And then the rest of the chapter, he prays for his disciples and not just the ones who were immediately present. He, he extends that prayer all the way down, like you'll see in verse 20 here, to, to include you and me. In verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. You know what that means? He prays for us too. You know, the Bible calls him in... Hebrews chapter 7, that he is an intercessor, that he, he continues to intercede for us. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's what he does. He con is in continuous intercession uh, for us. It's a, it's a rather profound passage. Uh, but I would like to just mention a couple of things before we jump in here uh, that this passage will also continue to illustrate to us just how important prayer is, how important it is for you and me. Look, if the Lord spent so much time praying, the Lord himself, you know, the Bible talks about him sometimes going off and spending all night in prayer or that he'd rise up early in the morning and, and pray, that he'd pray with his disciples or he'd pray alone. He spent a lot of time praying. If it was important for him, how important you think it is for us? The unique, unique thing about this is we get to hear the Lord actually praying. That's, that makes it really profound. And uh, it also, let me tell you what it pointed out to me, and perhaps it will to you also, is that the Lord didn't just preach to his disciples. He also prayed for them. He didn't just teach them and instruct them. He did that. He taught them. How important is that? He modeled his teaching by living perfectly what he taught. Amen. But he also prayed for them. He prayed for them. And I believe anyone in the ministry that, that has a God-given ministry is burdened to pray for those that they they minister to. 
because that's always, always on their heart. This blessed me. Just the thought, you know, the Lord, He prays for His disciples. He didn't just preach to them, go do this. But He prayed for them. And we're going to look at some of the things He prayed for, and it, it's, it's profound. You know, He treated them as though they were His family. In fact, they were His family. Because when they came and said, oh, Lord, your mother and your brother, and they're outside, they want to talk to you. And he said, who is my mother? Who is my brethren? And then he looked over at his disciples and he said, these are my mother and these are my brethren. In fact, he said, those who hear the word of God and do it, the same are my mother and my sister and my brother. So... You know how burdened you are to make intercessions for your family? I'm assuming you are. If you're a Christian, you're burdened for your family. You love them. You want to see them saved. You want to see them walk with the Lord. You want to see them delivered from this stuff that binds them, whatever it is. This is an evil world. It's an evil world. And so many people are bound and vexed and oppressed and depressed and confused and with so much junk. I, I know we spend a lot of time praying for our loved ones. Amen. We pray for our families. Amen. We pray for one another. That's one of the blessings of a body. that we, we get to pray one for another. But you know, the Lord prayed for them. And He still prays for His disciples. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's what the Bible says. He ever lives to make intercession. Hebrews 7.25. So... Praise God. This prayer extends through the ages and attaches to you and me as well. That's what verse 20 says. So, verse 1. The Lord lifted up His eyes to heaven and He prayed. Now, you know, I don't think the posture of prayer, whether you look up and pray or whether your head is bowed in prayer, it, it's not so much the posture of prayer as it is the posture of your heart, right. broken, humble before the Lord. Uh, you know, you're not pumping up yourself like the Pharisee did when he went up to pray, Lord, I deserve answers to prayer. I'm so good. I fast. I tithe. Look all the good things I do. I'm not like that guy. I deserve answers to prayer because I'm somebody. Well, the posture of prayer is, oh, God. <laughs> Yes. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. It, it reminds me of uh, the psalm in Psalms 121. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who created the heaven and the earth. We have to know where to look <laughs> when we pray. We have to look to the Lord. You know, there's a lot of people looking to the wrong place, I think, when they pray. Uh, one of the things that really... I would say it infuriates me, but I guess it doesn't really infuriate me. It just irritates me. When I see things, people posting things like all the time, like somebody might say, I'm really going through a difficult time. Uh, Y'all, you know, please pray for me. And somebody will post, well, I'm sending good thoughts your way. I'm sending good thoughts. Well, what's that going to do? Well, what do you mean good thoughts? Well, just happy thoughts? I don't, I don't get it. It's some kind of new age, double speak, gobbledygook. What it means is I'm not praying because I don't believe there's any God in heaven to answer, but, uh, I'm gonna send some kind of new age nebulous thoughts your way. No, that doesn't help. But if you're gonna look up your eye, look up your, to, to the heavens from whence cometh our help, because the Bible says, you know, that there is a God who is a very present help. In time of need, if we will but call upon him. <laughs> he called upon the Father. Father, he prayed. And, you know, he focused on honoring the Father and glorifying the Father in verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. But here's something that, that he prayed that I think we must know. Verse 3, he said, this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. 
that they might know thee, the only true God. Amen. There's many false gods out there, yep. uh, but eternal life comes through the one true God, through Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Uh, only one way to know God, through Jesus Christ. I like something Albert Barnes said. I'm going to read it to you. He's that 19th century Methodist theologian I told you about. Uh, I'm sorry, Albert Barnes was not a Methodist. I think he was Baptist. But listen to him. He, he said this. Verse 3. In this verse is contained the sum and essence of the Christian religion as it is distinguished from all the schemes of idolatry and philosophy and all the false plans on which men have sought to obtain eternal life. The Gentiles worshipped many gods. The Christian worships one, the living and true God. The Jew, the deist, the Muslim, the, the Socinian profess to acknowledge one God without any atoning sacrifice and mediator. The true Christian approaches him through the great mediator, equal with the Father, who for us became incarnate and died that he might reconcile us to God. That they might know thee. That's my prayer for my family. I know that. Lord, that they might know thee, the only true God. They have to be able to see through the fog of all of the lies and devils and false religions. Lord, open their eyes. Let them come to know you. He said in verse 4 that his task on the earth was done. I've glorified thee on the earth. I've finished the work that you gave me to do. I remember Paul praying a prayer or, or, or saying those same words. I've run the race, I've finished the course, I've Amen. kept the faith, and I'm ready, he said. He said, I'm ready. Here's what the Lord said. Same thing. Uh, you know, he speaks of his sufferings and his betrayal, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, as though they were already done, as though that was already completed. That's how certain it was. That's how he speaks of it, that, that all would be accomplished. I finished the work you gave me to do, and now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. You know, before, before Christ came to earth or before even the worlds were created, you know, Christ is eternal. That is, the Son of God is eternal. He is the eternal Son. There is an eternal Father, eternal Son, eternal Holy Spirit, an eternally triune God. He didn't become the Son at some point in time or become the Holy Spirit at some point in time. But from eternity, God is triune. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one eternal God. Three eternal manifestations, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He talks about the glory that he had before the world was, the glory he had with the Father. This would be a glory more bright and more brilliant than a million suns, uh, a brilliance and a light that can't be explained. Beginning in verse 6, the Lord begins to pray for his disciples. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. He said, I've revealed you to them, all the ones you gave me. Not only that, but verse 20, remember, all, that, all the ones he'd ever have, verse 20, the ones that would come really from the same place. They'd come out of the world, <laughs> that, including the world of lost religion, by the way. Amen. Um, but I want you to notice this endorsement that, that these disciples get from the Lord himself. Verse 6, he says, They have kept thy word. 
they've kept thy word. And, uh, you know, it means exactly that, that they followed it, they observed it, they held on to it, they treasured it, they valued it, they obeyed it, they believed it. They have kept thy word. Uh, there may have been others who didn't keep it. You know, there were many others who heard it, but, but walked away from it. But he said, these have kept Thy word. And, and uh, I, I say, Lord, help us to be keepers of your word. <laughs> Not just hearers, but uh, doers. Uh, don't let your word just inform us. Lord, Lord let it transform us. <clears throat> you know, the Lord, in, in this prayer, of course, elsewhere as well, but he put a very high emphasis on the word, on the word of God. Uh, verse 6, he says, I've given them... You gave them to me. He said, they have kept your word. Verse 6, look with me down in verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. I gave them the words, Lord, your word. He says, verse 14, I have given them thy word. He says in verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I mean, that's a big emphasis on the word of God uh, in the Lord's in the Lord's the other Lord's prayer this this passage right here he put a big emphasis on the truth on the truth well you know it's the truth that makes us free it's the truth that opens our hearts eyes and ears and and really brings us to the Savior Uh, he sent his word and healed them there's healing in the word healing in the truth there's sanctification in the truth. Sanctify them through your word, he said, verse 17. So how much we need the truth, right? Yeah. We need the word. That's what the Lord brought. He brought the truth. Guess what? You know, when the Lord came and he spoke to people, you know, he didn't take off his hat and say, let me entertain you. He was not an entertainer. He didn't do any magic tricks. <laughs> no, he spoke the truth. He spoke the truth because it was the truth that humankind needs. We need the truth. The truth that will expose what is false. It, it's the truth that will help us see clearly. It's the truth that will bring us to Christ. It's the truth that will break us from all these bondages we have with the world. How we need the truth. I never saw... Where the Lord made people laugh. Uh, He made them mad a lot of times. But I never saw where he made them laugh. Uh, Now don't misunderstand. I don't think there's anything wrong with a joke or humor. I appreciate humor as much as the next person. Uh, Maybe too much. but, uh, But when I read the gospel accounts... I don't see a single place where the Lord said, let me tell you a funny story. Amen. I mean, I can take a, a little bit of a funny story, but I, I, I can't handle a comedian. But the truth, on the other hand, the truth will make us free. You know, here's what he said in verse 14. I, I, I like this too. He says, I've given them thy word and the world has loved them. Wait, let me clean my glasses. Maybe it doesn't say that. No, I gave them your word and the world hated them. Because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Certainly the Lord's not of this world. But you know, he says you and I are not of this world also. It's not our home. That's more than just a nice song. It's a fact. This world's not our home. Don't get comfortable here. Don't try and make a life here. We make a living here, but not a life. Our life's not here. Our life is elsewhere. Our citizenship is elsewhere. I believe it's fine to be a citizen of this world as long as you realize you have a higher citizenship. 
it's okay to give obedience to the world, the world's king, as long as his commands don't conflict with the higher authority Amen. that we submit to. That's right. Can I also remind you of something else the Lord said just before this? You know, really it wasn't written in chapters, but in chapter 16, verse 1 through 4, he told his disciples this. John 16, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended, that, so that you don't stumble. I don't want you to fall. I don't want you to be scandalized. That's what the Greek word is. I don't want you to lose your faith. I don't want you to lose your way. Why would we do that? He says, well, verse 2, because they're going to put you out of the synagogues, which, of course, they wound up putting them out of the synagogues. Uh, he says, yes, the time comes that whosoever kills you will think that he does God's service. These things will they do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, you'll remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you, but he says, now I'm going to leave, but I want you to remember my words. The day is going to come when people will think that by ridding themselves of you, they'll be doing God a service. Now, I, I don't want to really get into that right here and now, but do you know this world is increasing its intolerance of your Christian faith? More and more, your Christianity is uh, being singled out for exclusion from not only the public arena, but even in your private life, people have been penalized, lost their businesses, lost their jobs with universities, with hospitals, with other places because they were Christians and dared to have a conviction about something. Amen. And because of it, they were persecuted, fired. You know, the Atlanta mayor just fired the, the uh, fire chief, yep. because he had the audacity not only to be a Christian, but to write a book about Christianity. And in it, it said something about sin. Wow. Specifically, it said that homosexuality was a sin. I think it mentioned it twice in all of the length of the book that he wrote. And because of that, he lost his job. The New York Times wrote a big editorial and said that the mayor did the right thing. We can't have people having this uh, freedom to believe whatever they want. It's unbelievable what's happening, how constitutionally granted rights are being deprived. Christians are being deprived of these rights. Let me tell you, the world that you're living in is changing in front of your eyes. And if something dramatic doesn't happen quickly, then you won't recognize this United States of America 10 years from now. You won't even recognize it. Amen. If that long, if it takes that long. If something doesn't change quickly, that's why we are feeling the same thing Christians all over the country are feeling we must pray. I'm hearing the same thing from Christians everywhere. The same burden, we must pray, we must fast, we must seek God for America because a revolution of the wrong kind is occurring. Amen. People think they do good by getting rid of the Christians with their convictions. You know, there's something else. I'm going to read another passage. Just another chapter over, chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. The Lord said, if the world hates you, you're doing something wrong. Because you should be the most popular guy in town if you're a Christian. Everybody should love you. No, he says, if the world hates you, you know it hated me first, right? This is what the Lord said. The world hated me. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. Boy, there you go. Let me tell you, you take that verse right there, that one statement, and you can judge ministries by it. Amen. Judge a ministry, judge a message, judge a book, you judge it. If 
you were of the world, the world would love his own. Watch out when everybody's saying, man, I love that guy's preaching. When the devils are saying that, when the lost are saying that, who have no intent of repenting of their sin, but they say, man, I love that person's. I could go to a church like that. And they do. And they do. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. No, no. Don't think that the world's going to love us. Didn't love the Lord. Not going to love us either. But our mission is to have the Lord approve of us. (laughs) (laughs) whatever the world does or says, our mission, Lord, let me just win your approval. Well, verse 9, the Lord begins to pray some very specific prayers for his disciples. Chapter 17, verse 9, he said, I pray for them. That is for his disciples, those who kept his word. That's what he says. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. I pray not for the world, verse 9. You know, this, this statement has caused a great deal of confusion through the years when people say, well, wait, I'm not sure I understand that. Why wouldn't the Lord pray for the world? Well, Consider this. When he says, I pray not for the world, he doesn't mean he's not praying for the world of lost men. Because the Bible says, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In fact, right here, the same chapter, verse 21, he says that they may all be as one as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I mean, he, he does pray for the world. But this specific prayer, this specific prayer, in fact, we're going to look at four specific things the Lord prayed. You know, he prayed specifically for his disciples. Now, that's those that were there. And verse 20, that includes us all the way down through the ages. We're in that, we're in that prayer as well. There are things he specifically prays for his disciples. He didn't pray them for the lost world. You know, there's some things for the lost world that it would almost be a contradiction to pray it for them. I pray, Lord, that you would bless that heathen so much that he would just be so prosperous and have no problems and no sickness. I can't pray that for the heathen. My prayer for the heathen is, Lord, bless them with salvation. Bless them with salvation. That's the greatest blessing of all. Open their eyes, open their hearts. But there are things here the Lord specifically prays for us. It's a fourfold prayer. And you know what? We want to be included in, in this prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so can we look at it? Verse 11, he prays first of all, Lord, keep them. Verse 11, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. He Keep them, keep them. It means to take care of them. It means to guard them, to guard them, to protect them. This same Greek word is translated preserve uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. You don't have to turn there, but listen to this. 
I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Preserve them. So the Lord's Prayer, preserve them, keep them, guard them, surround them, protect them. The word also means to hold on to, to hold on to them, uh, to watch over them. Amen. So that you don't allow anything evil to happen to them, which, by the way, is the second part of this same prayer to keep them. Look with me down in verse 15 when he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Keep them from the evil. Listen to Williams. He translated it this way. Keep them from the evil in it. He says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil in it. Keep Amen. them from the evil in the world. The English Revised Version states it this way. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I am asking that you keep them safe from the evil one. In fact, a number of verses translate it that way. You keep them, keep your disciples from the evil one. You know, there is an evil one. There is an evil one and it is an evil world and there are a lot of evils in the world. I mean, there's more evils that, uh, that we can mention. You talk about evil people, uh, crime, terrorism, just angry, violent people. Evil things, every kind of sickness, disease, infirmity, horrible plagues, unimaginable suffering that people go through. There's just evils of all kinds, whether it's the evil of hunger, the evil, the evil of, of overwhelming grief. But here's what the Lord prayed for his disciples. I'm glad the Lord prayed this for me and for you. He said, Father, keep them from the evil. That's even part of what's supposed to be our prayer when the Lord taught us to pray. Amen. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. Yes. There is a evil one who is out to kill, steal, and destroy, and he does what he does very well. I think sometimes about, you know, when it when it gets cold like this, I don't fish a whole lot. So I look at bait. <laughs> Think about, but this is going to be a good bait right here. Or that's going to be a good bait, you know. But, but, you know, here's a thought. You know, there is a fisher. The devil's also a fisher. A fisher for human souls. And his bait, he has had thousands of years to hone to perfection the baits that he uses to throw in front of men and women Amen. to get them to bite. Yep. He is the craftiest tactician. He knows what it will take. Well, you know, he knows what you bid on last time. Right. It's like, you know, I remember I caught fish right here with this bait before. Well, he remembers what you bit last time. And... The Bible speaks of the very real evils that there are in the world. The, the devil is called the ruler of the darkness of this world. The master of temptation. So we pray, Lord, deliver us from evil. But boy, it comforts me to know the Lord said, Lord, keep them, preserve them, protect them from the evil. Not only the evil in the world, but the evil one. The evil one as well. Many kinds of evils in the world and the Lord prays for our preservation from all of them Amen. keep them from the evil here's something else that he prayed he prayed in verse 11 that his followers would be one that is that they would be in unison in one accord having one heart one mind one purpose verse 11 now I'm no more in the world but these are in the world and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those who thou hast given me, 
that they may be one as we are. He picks this theme up again in verse 21. He says that they may, that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Now, now notice the kind of unison or unity the Lord is praying for. Because here's where he clarifies. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I've given them. That they may be one, even as we are one. Amen. You know, uh, this oneness is a oneness with the heart of God. The mind of God, the purpose of God, the goal of God. It's a oneness with Him. He wants us to be one with Him. Let's understand that. That would also translate into a unity among His disciples. Because as we're one with the Lord, we're going to be one with each other. Isn't that correct? You know, there is a blessed unity. There is a blessed unity. The Bible speaks of blessed, uh, the blessedness of uh, how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. Uh, Second Peter, Peter talks about the blessedness of fellowship, you know, amongst those of like precious faith. There is a holy unity, but there is also an unholy unity. And it's important that we know the difference. And what is a holy, blessed oneness, a holy, blessed unity, and what would constitute an unholy unity? Blessed unity is just as the Lord prayed here, that they may be one in us. Verse 21, very important to remember, that we are one in Christ, in Him, in our union with Him, our relationship with Him, our fellowship with Him, our agreement with Him. Because there is a unity that can be unholy, unapproved, ungodly. Uh, I can can give you a quick example. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4, 5, 6, 7. uh, I'm sorry, verse 14, 15, 16, 17. Listen to this. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. There's an unholy unity. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their God and they will be my people Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. There is an unholy unity. It's a unity that mixes things that are unequal. It's a forced unity that is unnatural, that is ungodly, that is unsanctioned. That's not what that's not the unity the Lord prays for. Amen. He prays for a oneness that we would have in Christ, where we would be brothers and sisters of the same father. Of the same father. So this is a oneness that transcends race, transcends ethnicity, transcends denominational barriers. I mean, if you think that, you know, Bless God, I'm a Baptist, and that's just the way it is. Well, do you realize how small a box you put yourself in and how exclusive you've you've excluded yourself from your brothers and sisters across the world? I would also mention, although... I don't believe that this is what we would call a pragmatic unity that the Lord is calling for. You know, the pragmatic unity where you come together with diverse beliefs, 
uh, people of all different beliefs, religions, and so forth, hold hands with them uh, and unite over a common cause. I don't believe this is what the Lord is praying for either. Because then you once again find yourself unequally yoked and you send a message that I think is confused at the very, at the very least. You know, I don't know if you heard about it, but back in November they had the, uh, the Vatican held its Humanum uh, Symposium. This is not the first time they've done it. They've, they bring together uh, leaders, scholars, priests, uh, speakers from a whole host of different religions. And they have a little bit of everybody represented there. Uh, the Pope, of course, was one of the main speakers. He had many, many Roman Catholic uh, speakers, cardinals, bishops, and so on. Uh, one of the leaders of Jainism was there. Um, uh, Hindu leaders, uh, Muslim professors. Uh, did I mention Hindus? Buddhist, Buddhist scholars, Buddhist leaders were there. There were representatives from the Sikhs. Uh, the Southern Baptist, uh, Rick Warren was there, uh, a rabbi was there, a Mormon, one of the leading Mormons in all the world was there. Uh, and, uh, you know, their purpose, they said their purpose in gathering together was to come to uh, a, an agreement on the sanctity of three things. And, you know, the goal... The goal, their stated goal, is not, is not wrong. Their goal was that there should, we should all recognize the sanctity of life, the sanctity of sex, and the sanctity of marriage. You say, what's so wrong with that, Brother Rusty? Well, I still don't believe that's the unity the Lord called for because now you're, you're, you're holding hands with Sikhs and Buddhists and Muslims. And, uh, and, and in doing so, don't we send a convoluted message to the world that really all religions are the same? You know, we're really all the same. We're just all different paths to the same God. You know, Christianity is very exclusive. If you're a Christian, there's no room for Buddhist practices. There's no room for Hindu yoga. There's no room for transcendental meditation. There's no room for occult practices. If you're a Christian, then this is what Jesus said. I'm the way. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. So if you're here with a whole host of people who represent darkness, because every false way is darkness, here's what the, here's what the Lord said. I hate every false way. I don't believe that that's the unity that the Lord calls for. He says, I've called you out of the world. You are not like them. We're supposed to be like him. I think verse 21 makes it clear that they also may be one in us, one with Christ, one in him, one heart, one mind, one goal. We have the same heart. Lord, let my life glorify you. All right, here's a third prayer he prayed. This, this is also, I think, uh, powerful and profound and delightful. He prayed for his disciples to have joy. Amen. Verse 13. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. He's praying for his disciples here now, remember that they would have his joy, his joy fulfilled. The idea here is the word is to be complete, my complete joy. It, the word also means to fill up to the very top, to fill to the brim. His prayer for you is that your joy would be filled to the brim, filled all the way to the top, not half full, not part joy, part misery, but that your joy would be filled up, filled to to the complete and filled all the time. It's a continuous sense that we would always be full of joy. You know, that's the life the Christian should live, a life of joy. Right. Holy joy, godly joy. Don't confuse this with silliness, with, you know, goofy joke telling and, uh, and the happiness, the happiness that the world 
seeks for because that is temporary and their joy, happiness, laughter and so forth is totally dependent on circumstances. Whereas our joy does not depend at all on circumstances. In fact, it transcends circumstances and focuses on the God of the Bible. Our joy is in him and therefore our joy is complete. So no matter what's going on in our lives, in our world, we can have the joy of the Lord, which Nehemiah said is our strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's have this joy. It's, you know, what Peter referred to as joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy unspeakable. You can't even explain the joy. How can you explain that? The joy of the Lord. It's... Impossible to convey the joy that abides in our heart, no matter what our circumstances are. Amen. When you should be falling apart, you can say, Lord, I'm in your hands. Amen. Lord, all things are in your hands. Don't, don't let the devil steal your joy, beloved. Don't let the world steal your joy. Don't let your trials or your circumstances steal your joy. Don't let your next door neighbor steal your joy or your kids steal your joy or your grandkids or your husband. Uh, Adam Clark, this was the uh, 18th century Methodist theologian. Here's what he said about verse 13. The religion of Christ expels all misery from the hearts of those who receive it in its fullness. (laughs) The Lord Jesus was not a miserable person, you know. Praise God. All right. I have one other prayer that the Lord prayed in this passage. Verse chapter 17. He prayed for the sanctification of his people. Sanctification. Uh, Verse 16 uh, and 17. He prayed, these are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He says in verse 19, For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through thy truth. You know, the idea of sanctification, let me tell you what it is. It's a big theological term. It simply means to be, uh, well, it means two things. It means to be dedicated, entirely dedicated or consecrated for a single purpose. In the in the Old Testament, they use these uh, the implements in the used in the service of God, the labor, the candlesticks, and and the the pans and the dishes. They were called consecrated, or even sanctified. In this sense, they were for one dedicated purpose only, and and could not be used for anything else. They were dedicated for one purpose. So when the Lord says, sanctify them, he's talking about sanctifying his disciples, it means that they be dedicated to one thing. And that's, of course, to God. That is our consecration. That is our dedication. It also carries the meaning of to be made pure or to be made holy. So we are to be fully dedicated, consecrated to the Lord and holy. You know, the Lord's commandment was be holy, be holy, uh, even as I am holy. And, And the word holy means to be exactly that, sanctified, set apart, consecrated for one thing, and that is for God, set apart for God. And he tells us, you be set apart for God also. You're not part for God, part for yourself, part for God, part for the world. Be consecrated fully to God. Here's the Lord's prayer that they be sanctified. Sanctify them. Separate them from the world. Set them apart for you, O God. That's his prayer. Make them holy. This is what the Lord prayed for his disciples. This is what the Lord prayed continues to pray for his disciples that we would be we would be fully devoted to God you know that's what he's calling for you complete devotion complete consecration if anything's been holding you back 
any any sin, any habit, anything you've been participating in, anything that you know the Lord doesn't approve of, then then can I urge you this morning to cast that thing aside for the worthless thing it is and completely and fully commit your life to Christ. Dedicate yourself to Him. Pray like the Lord prayed for you. Lord, let me be consecrated to you. Let me be holy. Let me come out from this world and be separate. I don't want to be condemned with the contaminants and and the contaminated. He wants us to be sanctified. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, this was the Lord's prayer. Preserve them from the evil, that they might be united in us, one in Christ, that they would be full of joy, and that we would be holy. You know, that's what the Lord prayed for you. That was the Lord's prayer for you. Be holy, that they would be holy. If we get that glimpse, just that profound glimpse in chapter 17 where we got to see the Lord actually in prayer. We got to hear what He prayed. That really is a profound glimpse. We got to hear His words, hear what He prayed, knowing that He was praying for you. That's what He prayed for you. Oh, Father, keep them, preserve them, protect them. You know, that that way we'd be kept until the day that Christ calls us. Keep them until that day. Preserve them. There are many, many evils in the world. The Lord prayed that we be kept from them all. That we be His, completely His, until the day He calls us home and we eternally His. Keep them. He prayed, Lord, unite them. That they be one in heart with us. One mind, one goal, one purpose. Let's ask the Lord to uncomplicate our hearts if we've been divided, if we've been halting in, in our complete commitment. How about we ask the Lord, Lord Jesus, let my heart be single. Let me be fully, fully for you, Lord, fully committed to you. He, he prayed that, he prayed, when you, when you heard him pray, you were looking through the keyhole, he was praying. He prayed, Lord, that they would have joy. Oh, Lord Jesus. Let our hearts be filled with your joy. And he prayed that they would be holy. That's the Lord's prayer. The Lord's other prayer. And Father, we do pray it today just as you prayed for us. Lord, it's our prayer as well. Thank you, Lord, for this glimpse into your own prayer life. That as you prayed for us, Lord, we make this our prayer as well. Lord Jesus, help us, Lord, we pray. In the name of Jesus, keep us, preserve us, preserve our hearts, our souls. Preserve us from the evil, from the evil temptations in this world, from the evil allures of the evil one. Keep us, Lord, protect us. Bring us safely, Lord, to heaven's shore. Lord, I pray that you would break down, humble us, break our hardened hearts, selfish hearts. Help us to truly be one with you and one with those who have the same heart, mind, soul. Lord, let us truly be your family. Lord, I pray that you would fill every heart with your joy, your peace, your comfort. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to live this life of consecration and holiness that you call us to. And it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.